Okay, we're on the book of Colossians chapter 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Ah, Set your hearts on things above. You see, the Bible, God is commanding you, giving you a direct command. Well, let me tell you, this is the best advice you'll ever receive. Even if you don't believe it's a commandment, it's the best advice you'll ever receive after becoming saved. Set your hearts, H-E-A-R-T-S, on things above. You are supposed to be thinking about things above, not below. Right now, you are living below heaven, so to speak. But your mind, you know, remember what it says, Romans chapter 12, the battle is in the mind. The battle is in the mind. Since then, you have been raised with Christ... Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. He's telling you, you have a superpower in the way you think. You know, we all go to um, movies. I don't go, but most people go to movies to see superheroes do make-believe things. But you have a superpower in your mind. What is that superpower? To think about things above and not below. You have given the power in Christ to completely put your mind on things that are not currently in this world. And how do you know what God's going to reveal to you or not reveal to you? Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Do you know it says here, Jesus has you hidden inside of himself? I, I wonder if you know that. Christ has you hidden like a treasure inside of himself. You are now hidden with Christ in God. Inside of God. When Christ was, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, that's amazing. When Christ, who is your life, you think your whole life is Jesus Christ? Or do you still separate yourself? Well, there's God, then there's Jesus, then there's Dave, myself. I'm a complete separate person you know, with feelings and problems and I got to go to work. And no, it's not what it says here. When Christ, who is your life, your whole life, you should only consider yourself in Christ Jesus now from now on and set your mind on things above, not on things, earthly things below. And when he appears, you will appear with him in glory. Wow. You're not going to be the one doing it. So you see, there's no, there's no works you can do to earn any of this. You're not going to do anything that qualifies you to enter into glory with Jesus Christ side by side. You're not going to do anything. So why do you keep trying? I'm not telling you not to do anything. I'm telling you to stop trying to work your way into heaven. Only Jesus Christ is doing all those works on your behalf. Jesus is not doing the works on his own behalf. He is already in heaven. He already lives there. He's doing all these things on your behalf that one day you will enter into glory with him side by side. 
If that doesn't give you peace and calmness on this earth, just enjoy this life. Enjoy your wife, your children. Just enjoy this life. Just enjoy the knowledge and wisdom you've been given through Christ. You are not a person anymore. You are a servant of Jesus Christ. You are in Christ. And when you finally start living that way, you become really calm. Well, I find that um, people become one of two things. And Paul touched on this in the previous chapter. You become boastful and bragging about yourself. Or you become very calm watching what Christ is doing in you, through you, and around you to glorify God's name. You become very calm. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongings, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, which means idolatry is false gods. Greed is idolatry, they said, always wanting too much money. Do you know by serving capitalism, you're committing idolatry? You're serving false gods. And what is the first three commandments in the Ten Commandments? Thou shall have no false gods before me. Serve only God. Look them up. The first three are about God himself. And it says here, now why does... um. Colossians talk about every time they tell you to stop doing something on earth, it always brings up sexual immorality, impurity, lust, L-U-S-T, evil desires and greed. Why does it always keep talking about the sins of sex? Because the sexual sins, the lust sins, the pornography, the womanizing, the sleeping with women outside of marriage, committing adultery with a woman other than your wife or other than your husband. A lot of women commit adultery in 2023. It's a crazy society. That's why it keeps talking about it, because it's a sin that is so hard to break once you start, because people love sex. People love sex. And when you got another person standing there, even if it's like almost a total complete stranger, hey, let's get a motel and uh, we'll go have sex together and enlighten ourselves, enlighten our bodies and feel good. And you see, God knows the great one, one of the top sins man is going to um, commit throughout all of history is the sexual sins against the flesh. You know, you're first sinning against your own flesh and you're sinning against God's commandments to not do that. If you notice, God keeps bringing it up. So even when you're watching a movie, you know, and it's uh, like it's under the disguise a romantic comedy to where the girl can't seem to decide between three different men which which of the three men is the best so she sleeps with all three continually throughout the movie trying to decide which man she's in love with while sleeping with three different men in the movie continuously without telling the other men or vice versa, the guy is in the movie sleeping with two or three women. He's a player, you know. They call him a player. I call him an idiot. God calls him stupid, naive, foolish. There's something about sexual sins that God hates. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Whoa. Did you hear what it just said? Because of these types of sins, the wrath of God is coming. 
Boy, we can say that today more than ever. The wrath of God is coming down to destroy everything on this earth because of sexual sins, lust, evil desires, and greed. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Woo! That is bad news. But it's good news if you're a believer. You know, I've, I've told someone recently, you don't want to be in, an, in a pornography bookstore when the rapture happens. They say, well, I'm a believer. I'll be raptured. Well, the book of Revelation, you got to be very careful. The book of Revelation says anyone who practices these types of things shall never enter the kingdom of God. They don't want to hear that. What if you're looking at pornography and you're raptured? It's going to be pretty embarrassing, huh? You know, anyone who commits these sexual sins, they hear from God all the time. They're always hearing God say, Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. They all tell me, yes, I hear God telling me to stop. He's always telling me to stop. But listen to what it said. Because of these types of sins, the wrath of God is coming. How much more do you want to be holy now like God? You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid, get rid of yourselves of all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Yeah. I'm telling you, you're being commanded here to get rid of anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. Do not lie to each other. God hates lying. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. So you're replacing these old sin things. You're replacing them, or say God in you, is replacing them with new knowledge and wisdom from the creator, God himself. He's not just taking them away from you. He's giving you the, the understanding and knowledge and wisdom of why He's taking them away. Why these things are bad. How they're harming you. I will say um, 80% of every married husband I've ever met in my life, they have all told me, well, I'm a believer, but I don't tell my wife everything. I say, do you lie to her? They say, oh, no, 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 no. I don't lie to her. I just don't reveal certain things to her. And I like, you're not committing adultery out there, are you? They're like, no, I just don't believe a spouse should know everything about each other. And it just said here, that's false. Do not lie to each other. And you wonder why your marriage isn't working very well. They says to me, well, you don't tell your wife everything, do you? I said, I've told my wife every single thing about myself. 100 times every story since the day I've been born, I personally could never live with someone if we didn't know everything about each other. And actually, we enjoy talking to each other. We enjoy telling each other. That's what a marriage is. We know about each other. We don't tell other people about ourselves in our marriage. That's our own private business, our marriage. But to be married to someone for 50, 60 years and not tell them everything about you, and you wonder why you have a lot of marriage problems? 
Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Meaning, you know what it said there? There's no racism in Christ. There's no black or white. There's no Jew or um, Gentile. There's no slave or free man. We're all made equal in Christ. So what does that say about, you know, they say today we're, we're all racist because, you know, of the color of our skin is white. Well, that's just not true. In Jesus Christ, it just said here, we are none of those things. We are all in Christ equal. So don't fall for this racism thing today. If you hate someone because they're black or brown or Jew, it's not racist. You just got a hate problem. You've been taught wrong since birth. You have a hate problem towards some of God's people. But they want to turn it into a what color you are thing. You may hate someone, yes, because they're black. I'll just come out and say it because that's the biggest argument today. But the word racism is not in the Bible. The word hate is in the Bible. There's men in Christ who love and there's men in Christ who hate. There's also men outside of God who love and men outside of God who hate each other. But I will say the men outside of God, if you're outside of God, you don't really know what love is until you're inside Christ Jesus. You can't, it's not possible for you to know what love is outside of Christ. But I am not a racist because I'm white. No, I'm either love all of God's people or I hate some people. That's the truth of that matter right there. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility. See, it, he told you all the things to get rid of. Now he's telling you the things to embrace. Clothe yourself, embrace compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. There you go, right there. You see, it's easy to forgive when you re realize and remember all the time that how much you've been forgiven. How much sin God has forgiven you of. So they try to teach these classes in grade school and college, and then it didn't work out. Remember during the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, they try to teach um, little kids that you're a racist just because you're white. And they tried to go down into like the first grade, second grade, and teach little kids that they're racist and that they must be punished somehow. It's a lie. It is a lie. It just talked about it here. Someone asked me once, I don't know, this years ago, am I a racist? I said, no, I'm a Christian. I love all God's people. And those who aren't saved, I pray that they will become saved. And they looked at me like, they said, well, I've never heard anybody say that. And they said, well, you're probably not a racist, Dave, but Every other white person I've ever met in the whole world is a racist. It's just not true. It's a lie. You know, if you answer, when someone answers you harshly, if you answer them like the Bible says, in love, you'll always win the argument every single time. If they come at you harshly and you answer in God's love from your heart, you're always going to be telling the truth in a very gentle, gentle, loving, patient way. That's the side I want to be on as a Christian.
Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So you take all of those qualities of God and you wrap them in love, like a blanket of love. And it says here, it puts them all together in perfect unity. You must start with love. If you want the answers to your life, you must start with God's love. And that is hard for a lot of men, maybe because the way they were raised or, you know, we're, we're told we must be tough guys. You know, we're not to take any crap from anyone. Anyone gives us crap, punch them in the mouth. That doesn't <laughs> that doesn't sound very loving, does it? <laughs> no. It's almost impossible for a man's man to back down from a fight if he feels like he's being attacked. It's like two grizzlies in the forest. They think they're under attack. But all they got to do is walk away. Now, if someone attacks you physically, I would say go ahead and fight back. Yes. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Do you have the peace of Christ today ruling your heart? Boy, I'm telling you, this, is, this might all sound for, like foreign language to you. God's love, gentleness, kindness, the peace of Christ. P-E-A-C-E. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. You notice it just keeps repeating itself. These lessons, the same words over and over and over. It has the same theme. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Most Christian music today on the radio sounds like um, rock and roll from the 60s. Most Christian music on the radio today is not has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It sounds like rock and roll from 1960s. It's they're not singing about Jesus. They're just singing to make a a, a hit song. Remember, they get paid for that music. If it's not popular, they won't get paid. And it won't be on the radio. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay, I want to give you an example right here. And this is going to be a tough one for you. Are you the best employee at your job? I mean the best of the best. Are you the number one best, most favored honored employee at your job. You should receive employee of the month every single solitary month because of your behavior at work. But you don't receive it because you don't care about rewards. Now listen. Have you ever walked into your... Now think about what kind of an employee you're supposed to be as a Christian even if you have a boss who is a total jerk, male or female, have you ever walked into your boss's um, office and said, can I have 10 minutes of your time? They'll go, oh, geez, what now? You know, here's another grumbling employee. Say, I want to tell you something. I'm a Christian and I want you to know this. From now on, I want to be the best employee here I want to be the most obedient, happy employee. I will, I will do anything you tell me from now on. And if you see it fit to promote me sometime, we'll talk about it. But for right now, I want you to test me. I want you to, I want to be the best employee you've ever had at this company. And I'm going to always talk positive. I'm never going to come in late. I'm never going to call in sick unless I'm dying sick. 
I'm never going to um, talk bad about the job. I'm going to encourage everyone. I'm going to do the job. I'm going to eat a healthy lunch at lunchtime. And I'm gonna I'm gonna be that perfect employee from now on, and I just wanted you to know it. Well, your boss is gonna stand there for a minute, and when he realizes you're serious, or she, they will say, Well, that is nice to hear. I've never heard anybody say that before ever in my entire life. So we'll see. I'm gonna hold you to it. And I'm going to see if you can handle it because I'm looking for two or three people to promote next year. And if you do all of these things, I will promote you. You see, you're not doing this because more money, more responsibility. You're doing this because you're representing Jesus Christ. Are you really representing Jesus Christ at your job? as the best employee who has ever lived? Same with your spouse. Have you ever gone home and said to your spouse, right to their face, I want to be the best spouse in the world. I want to be the best spouse you could ever dream of having. I want to be the perfect best spouse for you. And I'm going to do it in the name of Jesus and God's love. And I'm going to completely change and make our marriage a hundred or well, uh, 10 times better than it is right now. Have you ever said that to your spouse out loud? Have you ever gone to your child and said, I'm going to teach you in Christ how to be the best little kid, you know, in the world. You're, you're going to love your life. You're going to always live correctly. I'm going to always explain why we're doing certain things. I'm going to let you be involved in everything in our household, including the finances. How many people should tell their children about how much things cost would be a freaking flipping miracle if that happened? Because kids are 20 years old and they go, I have no idea how much it costs. But if you told them your monthly finances every month. And this is how much we make. This is how much the taxes are. This is how much we bring home. And this is how much we pay out in rent, mortgage, cars, everything. This is how much that ice cream cone cost. Your child is going to say, well, then we need to stop wasting all this money. Why are we throwing all this money away? Your child will surprise you. So have you ever done this? You're going to be the best of the best. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So it says, whatever you do, um, in another part of the Bible, it says, whatever you do, do it with all your might in the name of the Lord, to, to the glory of God. Do you do that? Is that how you live? Or do you just sit around complaining, oh, I wish um, I wish I had my job paid more. I wish my spouse wasn't so fat. I wish my kids weren't so stupid. <laughs> now, I'm over-exaggerating. But if you start living like Jesus, let's say your wife is overweight. You don't think she doesn't want to lose 20 pounds just to feel better? Of course she does. Come home one night and say, hey, honey, I'm on your side from now on. We're going to start eating salads. I, I want you to have what you want. She will start crying. She'll say, thank you very much. It's very hard out here all by myself, I'm glad my spouse, my husband, my knight in shining armor showed back up. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Boy, that's the, the wife I just described is the kind of wife you're supposed to be. Husband, I'll do anything to make our marriage 10 times better from now on. I'm going to put myself aside. 
I'm going to become the wife of noble character. Oh, man, you won't receive a lot of rewards for that, but you will get a lot of rewards and thumbs up from God the Father, I'll tell you that, and that will be your reward. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Aha. Honey, you go ahead and eat a salad. I want some damn barbecued ribs and chicken. And I'm going to go out and change the mud flaps on my truck tonight. <laughs> no. You were begging this girl to marry you just a few years ago. You were begging her. Oh, please, please, baby, don't leave me alone. I can't live without you. Let's have a big wedding and get married. And now you're like, you love, um, you know, the carburetor on your truck more than you love her. What happened? Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. That's because you're not inserting Christ into your marriage. If you were married to Jesus Christ and you had to come home and Christ was your spouse, for example, oh, you'd have a whole different attitude, I'll tell you that. But I want to say to the men here, you have the power to go home tonight to your wife, walk in, spin her around the kitchen, give her a couple twirls, give her a big kiss on the lips for like 60 seconds. Tell your kids, hey, look, daddy's kissing mommy. They're all going to start laughing. Ask your wife, hey, I got us all salads tonight. What kind of movie do you want to watch tonight? She's going to say, "Where? what would you do with my husband? Where did he go? Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, I want to say about the children, you have to be wise in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Your children will only do what you teach them. You, you got your children when they were one day old. The person they are becoming is the person you're training them to become. Now, I say this with all respect. If you are fat, stupid, and happy because your standards are so low, that's the only reason you could be happy with being fat and stupid because you've allowed your standards to drop down to 5 10%. So... Maybe I sound like a drill sergeant. I don't really care. Your children are seeing this. Your children are just that. Little, little baby children, even up to the age of 14, they barely know what they're doing about anything. Remember, if your child is 10 years old, they're not an adult. They were just pooping their pants six years ago, okay? Be gentle towards your children and teach them in the way they should go. Give them, so listen to this. Children, obey your parents. Give them a, give them a, a reason to obey you. Well, first you have to be the Christ example, but give them a reason to obey you. Don't drop your kids off at their friends on the weekend. Oh my gosh, that's like... um. Child cruelty. Take your kids fishing. Take them out. Take them camping. Take them where they should go. Train them. Take them down to the homeless mission and have them volunteer one weekend. Train them gently in the way they should go. Now, I'm saying your child in the first 25 years of this earth is going to turn out to be exactly like you allowed them to. There are some kids that are just almost perfect because their parents spend all that time with them. And even if they go to college for four years, which is a mistake, you should send them to a two-year trade school. And they can be a mechanic making $30 an hour right out of school or whatever. It says, children, obey your parents. Yes, this pleases the Lord. 
but the average child needs a reason to obey and follow you. And you got to be more clever. Come on. I mean, you're telling me you're not more clever than a 10-year-old? Fathers, do not embitter your children. In other words, do not make your children bitter. B-I-T-T-E-R. Embitter. E-M-B-I-T-T-E-R. Your children. Or they will become discouraged. Okay, I just gave you a big long speech about that. Your harshness. You're, you're harsh with your children. Your harshness is making them bitter. And they're becoming discouraged. But if your children are like, wow, we're going camping this weekend and I'm going to catch a big bass, largemouth bass right from the shore. My dad just taught me how to, um, you know, I took my son out even when he was an adult. I made him do things that would make you laugh, but I took him to a stream in the Rocky Mountains. I said, I want you to walk across this stream and come back. I won't tell you the whole story, but it was funny, put it that way. Then I told him, go under the water and try to catch a duck with, <laughs> with your bare hands. And he tried it because I encouraged him to see if it could happen. One time I drove my kid in about 12 miles down a snow road that even a, a tractor couldn't get down. We drove all the way to the Rocky Mountains. I gave him one match and told him, go out in the middle of the snowbank and start a fire with one match. You see, I didn't just tell him. I took him and showed him in real time. And now today he's doing fantastic. But it's, I, I take just a little credit. God gets all the credit, believe me. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Now, back then, there were slaves, but it wasn't like the slaves out of Africa. This was slaves who they sold themselves to you on purpose. They sold themselves to a rich man on purpose, right? And I think it's after seven years, you could, if you liked living there, you could put a big, huge ring in your ear and then you could stay there the rest of your life with your family and everything working for this master who was, you know, gave you a great life. Now, I, I'm going to put a twist on this. Might um, confuse you. Listen, slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything and do it not when they're watching, but not to get favor, but with sincerity and reverence for the Lord. Okay, what are you? Are you a slave to Christ? Well, Christ said, you are no longer slaves, but I call you brothers. But Jesus is our master and not a slave. You are a servant. So you could say, servants of Christ, obey your master Jesus and do it not only when they're he's looking at you or to make favor with him, but serve Jesus, your master, with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. You see how that changes everything? You were once a slave to this world, but now you are a servant, a so-called bond servant. You have been bought on the blood of the cross. You have been bought. So you want to serve Christ. That's what it means. Children need to be given a reason that they want to serve and obey their parents. Not just because their parents have the checkbook, no. 
Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Now think of what I tell you about your job. Have you ever gone into your job and completely said to your boss, I want to start being the servant, being the best employee here? That's what I want. Like when you walk in, your boss sees other bosses and other companies in your, um, you know, like area or whatever, or their competition. Like, let's say you're working at a sandwich shop and there's a guy down the street with another sandwich shop. And he says, he walks up to you and says, hey, have you ever wanted to um, come work at my sandwich shop? I'll give you like 30% raise. You see, I'm telling you, listen very closely. I'm telling you how to be in control of your destiny on this earth. When you allow yourself to become the best of the best to serve something, I don't care if you're working with wood, if you're a woodworker. Are you just working with wood? Or are you a master craftsman woodworker? And you know what it takes to uh, become a master craftsman with wood? You have to serve the wood. Almost to the point to where the wood starts telling you what's coming out of the object, what's coming, you know, what's in the wood, what's the best way to sand down the wood, you know, wood laid the wood. I mean, if you're a master, I mean, you know, you can have an eighth grader make a wooden bowl in shop class. And then you take that, you know, home, it's nice. The mother throws some, you know, walnuts in it, whatever. The thing's worth about $10. But if you ever seen a real master craftsman make a, a wooden bowl, and that bowl's worth like $900 in a shop. That's the difference of what God is saying to you here. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know what will you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. And that's the deal here. You're going to receive your reward from Jesus one day in heaven. Now think about this. If you do what I told you, the advice I gave you, and you pour it all out for 30 years at some job, right? But then you were smart enough to save 20% of all your paychecks and you retire at age 50. You know, with like, half a million dollars in the bank, you can retire easily. And you never receive a reward from your job. Well, guess what you're guaranteed? You will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Oh, that changes everything, my friend. That changes everything. You're not serving your job. When you're going to work, you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ while you're at your job. Do you see the difference? You're not serving. You know, I've been a cashier before. And people say, and I'm going to just tell you the way they said it. They say, Dave, can I ask you a question? I say, sure. Why are you always so damn happy? <laughs> I smile. I say, well, you know, do you really want to know the answer? They say, yeah, because I've been observing you when I come in here for several years. And I can't see anything about you that makes you that happy. There's either a reason I don't know about, and then they told me, or 
They said, don't take this offensively, but or you're you're mentally handicapped. And I start laughing. I say, well, okay, I'll tell you the reason. You might not like it, but that's not my business. I'll tell you why I'm so happy. Do you want to know? And they say, I, I do. I want to know. I'm too curious. I want to know why you're always smiling. And I pointed up towards the sky and I said, Jesus Christ. And boy, the answers, the responses I get. I would say 40% of the people back then say, I'm a Christian too. You're a Christian. They say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not this happy. How, how come you're a Christian and you're so much happier than I am? And then we have a talk. Well, how much do you follow the Lord every day? And how much do you follow your own earthly problems? The other 60%, when I point up the sky and I say, Jesus Christ is the reason I'm so happy. They go, oh, yeah, I knew you were going to give me some stupid answer like religion. <laughs> Which makes me laugh more and just makes me happier that they're just flipping out. But you're not serving your boss. You're, you're serving the Lord. You're not serving your spouse. You're serving Jesus by the way you treat your wife. And believe me, if you don't believe me, Jesus is watching. Jesus is watching every move you make, my friend. Every single move you make. And he is liking it or he's looking at you saying, oh, man, I got a lot of work to do with this person. That guy comes home every Friday night, five hours late, drunk. And then blaming his wife and kids for all his problems. Oh, I put so I put the food on the table here. I pay, I make the house payment. I go to work 50 hours a week. Blah, blah, blah. Wah, wah, wah. I hope and pray you're not that way. I hope because that's not the Christian way. That's not what something that's going to impress God, put it that way. And I'll leave it at that. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs. And there is no favoritism. That's the biggest warning you'll get out of the entire Bible put in two sentences. Anyone, this is believer or no non-believer, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs. And there is no favoritism. And you say, well, well, wait a minute now. I've thought all my sins were forgiven. And no matter what I do, I'm always forgiven. Whether that's true or not, let me tell you this. In heaven, there's something called rewards and crowns. You will be given certain rewards and certain crowns in heaven. And if you were, you know, I say a stick in the mud to put it in a nice way or you looked at a lot of pornography or something as a Christian, you are not going to receive as many rewards as you could have, and you're not going to receive as many crowns as the Lord wanted to give you. And that is the end of this chapter. <laughs>